Presented by Caltech. So, we talked about normal modes, and so we had the two coupled oscillators. We did went and looked at three as well. Here I have six, and then we'll go and add more and more. But six is still something that maybe we can see what happens and sort of figure out what the normal modes are. So let's see. So if there's six balls here, there's six degrees of freedom. And so we should have six normal modes. So the first, the lowest frequency one, we expect them all to be moving back and forth. That one's pretty easy. Some of the others aren't so easy. So hopefully I will be there on this right now. So let's see if it goes. Well, they aren't all quite identical, I guess, but it's more or less going like this and this. Well, it's having some trouble here and there, but can I give it a little chance? Okay, that's better. Every now and then you'll find it gets hung up a little bit because they're not quite exactly the same. Like now, it's trying. Okay, so then the next one, the next one should be kind of three going this way and three going that way. And, and you, can, you can analyze this by, I mean, you can figure it out for yourself by, by thinking about sine waves. So the first one, so if, if we have the endpoints, the first one, It'll kind of look like this. So it'll be one, two, three, four, five, six, all going the same way, back and forth. The next mode, if I draw a little farther down, you'll see the first three up here, second three down there. So you see three going one way, three going the other way, and then of course it slashes back and forth. And you can keep going on these. The last one will be, uh, every one will have its own peak. So hopefully I've got six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Every one will be going differently. And the ones in between you can fill in as well. Even if we can't see it on there so well, you'll be able to fill them in. So that's sort of the secret to this, is think of a sine wave, and, and uh, then you can figure out where the nodes are all going to be, where the uh, directions are all going to be. Let's see. So this was the first one. Let's try going up to the next one. Hopefully it doesn't remember the first one too long. So OK. so. And this one doing the other way. So going like that for the three and three. Well, it's working pretty good. Okay. Let's try the next one. That's going to be kind of twos and twos and two. Two, two, two. Uh, let's see. So where's that? That's it. Uh, it has some memory of where it started so I may have to give it some help that didn't help much but uh, okay it's starting okay so that's pair 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 and last one's having trouble but it's trying 
Okay. If I go up again, you kind of need your sine wave to figure it out. So this one's kind of one, two, two, one kind of pattern. Not really doing it yet. And of course the amplitudes are different, so you can't expect them to f quite follow each other. one's having trouble. Okay, not too impressive maybe. Uh, it's, it's, you get, these intermediate ones are really tough to, to see. Well, let's go up to the next one. So this is the, the penultimate one. So this one should be uh, kind of these two go apart, these two go together, those two go apart. And that's kind of doing it. Use your imagination a little bit, but that's, that's what it's doing. These two are kind of going together. These two are opposite and these two are opposite. Let's try the high, highest one. <clears throat> Now they should all be going, just alternating. This red one starts moving. <clears throat> of course, I'm changing one from one mode to another, so it gets confused in between. You have to wait a little while. <coughs> so it's doing it. Okay, I'm convinced. Let's see it die down. But it's in that mode. Oh, alternately going. <clears throat> okay. Um, So then we started talking about traveling waves. And I have both some electronic uh, illustrations and some mechanical illustrations. We're basically going to the continuum limit on our system of balls and springs, pendulums and springs. <clears throat> if I Let's do this one first. I've got to put it on the screen. Okay. Oops. Good. Okay. <coughs> so I have <coughs> a pulse generator. It's generating a pulse. Um, That's the blue curve. If 
just a little curve. Let's let's check. The pulse is going down a 40 meter 40 meters of cable. So you calculate what the speed of light is for 40 meters. Um, and then I'm looking at it with an oscilloscope. So, yeah, of course. The, red, the, the yellow is the pulse that's coming out of here. And you see there's a second yellow. That's a pulse coming back. So I have one channel looking at the output of this, but it's seeing the pulse that's being sent out and it's seeing the reflection that's coming all the way back through a whole 80 meters, twice 40. The blue curve is the one at the end of the 40 meters. So this transmission line, we're gonna analyze this, but we can think of it as a series of inductors and capacitors in some lumped circuit kind of representation, just a whole long sequence of this, taking the limit as things go to zero. Uh, and we're looking, we're feeding in a voltage here. We're looking at the voltage out there. And we see this is open. This is where the voltage source is. So this is our pulse coming in. If I leave this open, I see a pulse that's reflected back. I can try some different things. So we're just gonna keep, keep these observations in mind for when we actually analyze this. I can short the end here. I can just put a wire across the end here. That's gonna make the voltage just zero at the end. And indeed it does. The blue just went down to zero. Look what happened to the reflected pulse. We still see a reflection. So the, so the pulse I put in is positive. The reflected pulse is going negative. When I left it open, the pulse reflected is going positive. So we have to figure out why that's happening. Okay. This system of inductors and capacitors has a characteristic impedance, as we'll see. Uh, this is 50 ohm cable, RG58. I'm gonna put a 50 ohm resistor on the output. So I'm gonna put a 50 ohm resistor here. So the amplitude of the pulse that I got at the end, the blue went down by maybe a factor of two and the reflected pulse vanished. No reflection anymore. So we'll understand why that's happening. But that's a, effectively a pulse that's traveling down the cable and either reflecting or not. Let's try something else. I actually have here a circuit that really is this circuit. Just a whole bunch of inductors and capacitors as discrete components coming along. <clears throat> so the two traces on there. One is the input, which I think is the one that's mostly hidden, but we'll find out. You can just barely see a little bit of blue I remember right, that's the hidden one. The other, oh gosh, the colors are completely different than what I thought. Okay, so the input is the green, not blue. I guess blue plus green plus that color purple makes blue. Um, and I've got the scope probe here. I had it at the beginning of the circuit there. So you can see I'm just looking at the, at the same signal both, to, both ways. I can move down this. Yeah, let's go down to here. It's no longer quite on top of it. It's moved over. So the, there's a phase difference between the two now. 
I can go farther, the phase difference is bigger. Yeah, I can go as far as I can reach. And the phase difference is bigger. And I haven't gotten, the, you know, if I kept going, if I had a much longer one, I'd be able to go to 2 pi and keep, keep going through. So <clears throat> that's 200 microsecond per division. Uh, it's gone one and a half divisions there, about 300 microseconds is the delay I've introduced in the pulse by propagating down there. Of course, if I just had a wire here, I'd be going down at the speed of light and I wouldn't see much phase difference on this scale. So these lumped elements are really doing something. They're, they're, making, they're making a delay in the, in the uh, uh, sine wave. So we have to figure out what the speed is of propagation in a transmission line. That one or that one, they're both very similar. That's a, sort of a continuum limit of that. It has a speed of propagation, it's not the speed of light. <clears throat> okay, so we will make it quiet again. So we'll analyze this. I just wanted to set it up so that we can understand what's, what's going on in these circuits. Oh, I thought I blanked it. Uh, no, not that way, that way, that way. So I have the mechanical equivalent of that. Which one should I do first? I like the rubber one. So stand back. This could get dangerous. I just hope that clamp holds. And this one too. Um, just a stretched rubber hose. I can send the pulse back down it and it reflects. So we have a traveling wave here. Pulse is just going down and it reflects the other direction. There's more than one degree of freedom in this. I could, I could pull it out this way. And then you get a, it's harder to see, but you get a pulse that's, that's this way on, on the string. I could even maybe pull it back this way and sort of get a longitudinal pulse. So this is, I claim, Basically, the continuum limit of something like that system of, of balls on the rods, my pendula. Just to see a different mechanical system, let's try the spring. out eventually, but it's, it's got a reasonably good cue. I can, uh, it's still going. Of course, I can do the transverse direction. It goes the and So the two directions aren't, aren't very much coupled. So we can see it kind of preserves the direction it went in. I could try my longitudinal so those were two transverse directions, two transverse degrees of freedom, or two transverse polarizations, we might call it. 
especially in electromagnetism, we call them polarizations. When the electric field could go that way or could go that way, transverse to the direction of motion. Let's try a longitudinal polarization. <coughs> the fact that you're hearing it means there's damping, because it's losing energy to the air. Okay. So this is where we're going. <clears throat> Fortunately, nobody was hurt. Okay. <clears throat> any questions on any of the demonstrations? So I want to go back to where what we were talking about. We were talking about these traveling waves. <clears throat> so we had just started with the, no with the notion last time <clears throat> what I want to introduce now is the wave equation. <clears throat> if we have a wave, we've got to have a wave equation. <clears throat> so let's see, we had, so we claim we can write a traveling wave as a superposition of traveling waves in two directions. So it's just a sum, superposition meaning sum, of a left traveling and a right traveling. So we take our notion up there and say y of x and t can be the sum of a wave traveling to the right and some wave traveling to the left, not necessarily the same function. Okay. And I'll make the claim that this is, in fact, the most general solution <coughs> to the, well, homogeneous wave equation. <coughs> that is d squared y by d x squared is times v squared is equal to d squared y by dt squared. It's a homogeneous differential equation. Any, any, if I have a solution y, then any multiple of that solution is also a solution. <coughs> And it's a partial differential equation. It has depend, y is it dependent on both x and t. So it's relating <coughs> the variation of y with x to the variation of y with time. <coughs> Let's just check and see that it really is, a, that, that our assumed form really is a solution. <coughs> so let's say. First of all, let's define the total derivative of a function f prime. We're going to define this symbol to mean that I take df, so f is a function of x minus vt, so df of x minus vt by dx minus vt. It's just a derivative with respect to whatever the argument of the function is. Okay. 
So now let me plug f into here. I could do g2, but let me do f um, and plug it in here. I get, well, I'll do both. I'll plug, I'll plug y in and plug it into there and see what happens. So dy by dx, say. <clears throat> OK, well, so the first term is f. So let me take the derivative of f. And then I have to take the derivative of x minus vt with respect to x. So use the chain rule. This is just equal to 1. Likewise for g. I'll have g prime times dx plus vt by dx, which is just 1, so I'll just get that. So this is just f prime plus g prime. And so therefore, if I do it again, I'll get f prime plus g prime, double prime rather, second derivative, OK? Now I've also got to figure out the derivative with respect to time. So the partial of y with respect to t, so f, f prime, f prime times dx minus vt by dt, this is minus v. Doing a similar thing with g, I get plus v g prime, since this is a plus sign here and, and not a minus sign, OK? Would I take the second derivative? I'll get an f double prime, and I'll get another factor of uh, minus v, which will be v squared. And here I'll pull down another power of, g, of v as well. So I get v squared, v, uh, g, g double prime v squared. So this is just v squared f double prime plus g double prime. <clears throat> This was f double prime plus g double prime. The only difference is the v squared. So if I multiply v squared times f double prime plus g double prime, I'll get the bottom relation. So it works. Okay. <clears throat> um. You can go back and check it as it, as it must our sinusoidal form also satisfies it. But you can check that explicitly if you like. <clears throat> this generalizes to higher dimensions. So, so it, you know, as long as we have a homogeneous and isotropic medium that uh, we're going through, uh, we could, well, we, this all works. Um, and we can generalize to n dimensions. And what we get is the wave equation sum from i equals 1 to n of d squared by dx sub i squared. So I'll write this as just an operator out here, times y is equal to v squared d squared y by dt squared. Another notation for, for this guy out here is the Laplacian in however many dimensions that, we're, that we have. Typically, we'll be using three dimensions, of course. And, and so the Laplacian is the Laplacian in three dimensions that we're most familiar with. And the solution <clears throat> y of x, so x is a vector, I'll make it explicit here, is equal to f of 
So I'll write it this way. K dot x minus omega t plus g of k dot x plus omega t with wave number in n dimensions is just k is the square root of a1 squared up to k sub n squared, just the magnitude of the vector k, and velocity v, which is a vector now, is omega over k in magnitude in the direction of the wave number, in the direction of the wave vector. So then you have a very similar equation. Yeah. Yeah, I think I missed a step on the um, partial infinite dimension, partial differential equation. Uh, in the in one dimension, the velocity is on the opposite side of this equation. And yeah, so in my <laughs> I, okay, so I put it in the wrong place, one place. So so this is right. So this must be wrong. Thank you. I get carried away sometimes. <clears throat> OK, so that's general considerations about waves. Okay. Let's get a little more explicit and think about masses and springs and how we get to strings or rubber hoses or whatever. They really are the same thing, just different number of degrees of freedom. I just keep adding balls here, and pretty soon I get to a string. Well, sort of. Let's see how it works. <coughs> so let's do the problem of the vibrating string. <clears throat> the book works this out by considering the forces at any point in the, in the string. But I'm going to take a hint from uh, our homework, from 20 and just work it out as a limiting case of something like that. As a limiting case of, maybe better as a limiting case of the air track with multiple masses and strings. So I'm going to model, so, so from problem 20, we found the following. We found that if I had a system of masses, maybe keeps going. They're separated by distance L. So even if it doesn't look the same, they're all the same distance there. Um, they're all mass M. They're joined by springs. With spring constant uh, uh, K, say, but we'll quickly. Uh, um, and let's see, I got to put the coordinates down. So this is Y sub I minus 1 is this distance. Uh, this dis distance is, is Y sub I and Y sub I plus 1. So the vertical directions are uh, in the y direction. Okay. So we found that we could write y double dot plus p 
over ML, MY is equal to zero, where Y is Y1 up to Y sub N. T is the, what we call the string tension. And M is the following matrix. Let me write it over here where I've got a little more space. Two minus one, and then zeros. <coughs> minus one, two minus one. Minus one, two minus one. And so forth until you get to the end with a two and a minus one. Everything else is zero. So it's a tri-diagonal matrix. <clears throat> so <clears throat> this is a discrete system that we're still talking about here. So OK, T is related to K. Uh, maybe it's K. I don't remember. Um, <clears throat> But I want to go to a continuous string. So I want to take the continuous limit of this. So this is kind of a common exercise. Um, just leave it this way. Go back over here. <clears throat> so how do I do that? For a continuous string, well, if it's going to be continuous, these masses are going to get closer and closer together. And there's going to be more and more of them in the same total string length. And I, want the, I don't want my string to get infinitely heavy, so I'm going to let the masses go to zero. So let's see. Let's um, take the limit. As n goes to infinity, with a fixed total mass, and we'll call that m, script m for the total mass, which is just n times the individual masses. Just adding them all up. And fixed total length, that is the distance from one end to the other of my, uh, in x, uh, of L is n times little l. Now I'm going to ignore the fact that it's really n minus one pieces of length, the way I've defined things, because in the limit, as n gets very big, that extra little l doesn't account for anything. It's just vanishing. So I'm just going to take n times l for capital L. Let's let <coughs> mu be defined as the mass per unit length. So mu is the mass per unit length of this on the string. It's the linear density. <clears throat> OK. So let's see. So I have my differential equation. Uh, let me uh, do this all over here. So I have my differential equation, y double dot plus t, you know, this. So I'm going to take this, still have the y double dot, I still have the t. Now let me manipulate the denominator there. Little m is just the total mass divided by the number of segments that I have. And little l is just the total length divided by the number of segments that I have. 
times my matrix times y is equal to 0. So that's my equation. So I can write this slightly differently. y double dot plus t over, so I'm going to use the fact that I've defined mu here as m over l, so that's going to give me a t over mu times an n over l squared. Two n's here, one l plus another l in the bottom there, times m y equals 0. <coughs> so l over L over n is going to be a quantity that's going to go to 0. And the limit as n goes to infinity. Okay. We kind of know, if we think about it a little bit, we kind of know that we should end up with a wave equation somehow. That has second derivatives in it. We have a second derivative here with respect to time. Let's remember what the second derivative is with respect to x. So we're, we're thinking of fixed time. So we don't have to worry about uh, uh, the time varying too. We're just taking a snapshot at a given instant of time. I'm going to take the second derivative of something of y with respect to x. That by definition is the limit as delta goes to 0 of y of x minus delta minus 2y of x plus y at x plus delta divided by delta squared. That's just you know, taking one derivative and, and redoing it, and you get that as the second derivative in, in some way. Oh my goodness. Look at the pattern of this thing. Minus 1, 2, minus 1. 1, minus 2, plus 1. It, this is just m. Isn't that cute? Okay, so minus n over L m is equal to minus m over delta squared is precisely this operator. So we're done. Therefore, d squared y by dt squared, that's the y double dot, minus, for the minus sign, t over mu, d squared y by, um, yeah, okay, we did it there, by dx squared is equal to zero. So that's the same as what the text worked out by considering forces. It's the wave equation for our string. The wave equation. <coughs> the speed, you can read off the speed. Just v squared is equal to t over mu, or v is just square root of t over mu. We 
could also use our limit to figure out the energy. So we can figure out how energy propagates. So kinetic energy. So energy. Kinetic energy. First. So let's see. I better, uh, I'm going to go back over here. Okay, so the kinetic energy is K equals one half mv squared. V is the sum over the masses. I equals one to n dy sub i by dt squared. That's the kinetic energy. Yeah. I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. This operator is d squared by dx squared, if you like. <coughs> um, OK, so there's the kinetic energy. I do the same thing. 1 half, I've got to change my mass into something with n in it. I'm going to multiply by 1 for a reasonable c in a moment. dy sub i by d t, in this case, squared. And so that's equal to 1 half of my linear density, using up one of those L's, times an L over N, times the same sum. So I can notice that this is now 1 half mu times L times 1 over n times the sum of things that there is an index. That's just an average. It's an average of this quantity. Okay. So that's just, and I'll just write it as with symbols like this. I hope that's okay. I could write it with a bar over it too as an average, but it's just expectation value, meaning average, of that quantity. It's just 1 over n times that sum. So I'm just taking the average of all the values, okay? which I've been writing as this because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to the continuum limit on my average. Okay. So this symbol means the average of Okay, but now L times this average in the continuum limit as n goes to infinity goes to, well, there's the L, and then I have in the continuum limit my sum becomes an integral. It's an integral over something of length L, so it's from 0 to L, so that's like a 1 over n times my sum from 1 over n. Uh, up to one over n, up to n, from one to n, of dy by dt squared dx. See, this is averaging over values at different x's, and so I'm doing my average over different values of x's. It's kind of a shortcut that's, that's kind of handy uh, to do these things. And so therefore, um, And so therefore, I get um, let's see. So K then, my kinetic energy is equal to one half 
So that L cancels the 1 over L, so I just get that integral with a 1 half mu out front. That's my kinetic energy on the string. I didn't have to work too hard for that. Potential energy. Okay, so potential energy. So I have a distance L between in the horizontal direction, and I have some y sub i minus y sub i minus 1. So the total length of that particular, of the ith spring is s sub i. And so I have the potential energy in spring i is equal to the tension times s sub i minus l. So s sub i is the extended length here. Okay, but so S sub i is equal to just square root of L squared plus yi minus yi minus 1 squared. And so I do a Taylor series expansion of this and get that this is approximately L times 1 plus 1 half of y sub i minus y sub i minus 1 divided by L squared. And so that's uh, approximately equal to then just, well, let's see. So u sub i then is just plug this in. So I get a 1 half. I get the t. And then I get a delta y sub i, meaning that by delta, meaning the difference between two succeeding values of y. Uh, delta y sub i over L squared um, times C. So this, this canceled from that. The, the S sub i minus L, this one got canceled, in case you didn't know where that went. And then I'm left with the L. So we're almost there. <coughs> Three better be. So we do the same thing. We sum over all, all of them. One half TL. Uh, yeah, sum over all of them. Delta Y sub I over L squared. Again, this looks like one half uh, t n times l times one over n. I want to pull down a one over n so I get an average. Delta y sub i over l squared. This is now my average of dy by dx. squared from 0 to 1. So u is then equal to 1 half t times l times 1 over l integral from 0 to, so that's just 1, of dy by dx squared dx. So we have an expression for the energy. So this cancels that. So we have an expression for the total energy that's an integral from 0 to L of dy by dt squared times mu plus dy by dx squared times t. And that's the total energy in the, in the, in the string. 